and uh, hope to uh, bring to you all a message of uh, progress and hope within the treatment of metastatic renal cancer. Uh, it's customary for speakers to uh, divulge any interest that they have uh, with the uh, pharmaceutical industry, so I have participated in advisory boards uh, with Fire, uh, Pfizer, Bayer, Wyeth, and Novartis, and I have a research grant from Wyeth. So uh, this afternoon, I hope to uh, review with you the story of a patient of mine who's done particularly well with his metastatic renal cancer. Uh, I'm going to give a general review of treatment options uh, with particular attention to first and second line therapy uh, and go over some of the current controversies in metastatic renal. So this is my patient, uh, Mr. C. Uh, I first met him back in 2005 when he was a very fit gentleman, uh, very active with uh, golf and hockey. And in the fall of that year, he noticed some uh, pain in his right side. So he went on to a CT uh, scan, and this revealed uh, multiple uh, spots in the liver. Uh, and uh, he had a, a, um, a malformation in the kidney that he was born with. Um, you can see the kidney crosses the midline here. And it's a very large tumor. Uh, that started in the kidney and went up towards the liver. So he had a biopsy and it showed that he had the most common type of kidney cancer, which is clear cell. Now at that time in 2005, the list of available treatments was, as you can see, quite short. Supportive care means relieving pain and other symptoms. So interferon was the only commonly available drug at that time. So that's what Mr. C started. And uh, in the mid, mid of that year, he started self-injections of interferon three times a week. Uh, predictably, with that drug, he became tired, he had some muscle aches, but he was still able to carry on with most of his uh, activities. In 2006, he came back from his golf uh, trip down south, and the CT scan unfortunately showed that the cancer which had spread to the liver from the kidney had grown. Now what you can see happened in that intervening year is that a new treatment became available. Um, the, this is just the name of the, the physician who brought this treatment to the forefront. It became available because we now uh, at that time knew the results of a large study that showed that patients who had previously uh, received interferon uh, did better if they received serafinib than if they received placebo. So that's where I think the progress started here. So Mr. C started on that drug, uh, and he did quite well on it. Um, he had manageable side effects, a few sores in his mouth, uh, hands and feet became a bit dry, but he was still out golfing. Unfortunately, in 2007, again, we saw growth on the CAT scan, but now we have an even longer list of drugs. So added to that was uh, sunitinib, uh, or sutent, as some of you may know, again because of the results of a large research study. This became available through an extended access program, and the patient started on it and did very well for another one and a half years. But near the end of 2008, uh, he noted some uh, decline in his energy, starting to take the, the cart on the golf course rather than, uh, rather than walking his usual 18 holes twice a day, uh, because of some enlargement in the spots in the liver. And now we have yet another drug. So at that time, he started on Everolimus, which some of you may know as Affinitor. Again, because a large research study showed that uh, patients who receive Affinitor after the growth of their cancer on either Sutent or Nexavar do better. So, you know, as you can see, there's been a, a lot of stripes added to the bar over the really uh, narrow number of years. Uh, so he started uh, Everolimus or Affinitor in December of 2008. He's still going south for golf trips, has very little in the way of complaints other than an occasional mouth sore. So what have I learned from my patient? I've learned that the treatment options for metastatic renal cancer have expanded dramatically over the matter of a few years. I've seen more progress here than in the treatment of any other type of cancer. And there's also many more drugs on their way down the pipeline, so I consider it a very hopeful time in the treatment of metastatic renal cancer. So that's what we're going to discuss now. What do we do uh, to best treat the cancer after it has spread outside of the kidney? And that's what metastatic means. It means that it has spread to other locations, usually through the bloodstream. 
So main uh, options are this list, uh, and I'll discuss each bullet uh, in, uh, in sequence. First, we're going to talk a bit about surgery, then radiation, which is aiming x-rays at the cancer, then medical treatment, which is usually pills, and supportive treatment, which means helping the patient to uh, deal with uh, effects of both the cancer and the drug. So surgery. Uh, some patient asked me, well, if you already know that the cancer is spread to my lungs, why does it help to take out the kidney? So how can surgery help? Well, many patients will undergo what we call a cytoreductive nephrectomy. Nephrectomy obviously means removing the kidney. Cyto means cell. And uh, so what we're doing is we're reducing the number of cancer cells within the patient's body. So why do we do that? Because we know from studies that were done a few years ago that patients who have their kidneys, kidney removed, even in the face of, uh, of metastatic disease, live longer. Now why is that? And the answer is we don't know. Most people believe that the, the primary kidney tumor, the cancer in the kidney, acts kind of like a mother ship that's sending out messages to the little babies, which are the metastasis, telling them to grow. And if we take out the mother ship, uh, we can hope that, and we often do see, uh, slowed growth or even a reduction in the size of the babies. So some of you may ask, well, my kidney's still in. Why didn't I get my kidney out? And for some people, the surgery is simply too risky. They can't bear the risk of a uh, general anesthetic because they have unstable heart disease or recent stroke. Uh, more commonly, the picture I see is that the number and size of uh, metastasis, so say the number of uh, spots within the lungs, pose more of an immediate threat to the health of the patient than the tumor in the kidney. And so for those people, may, we may opt for pill therapy first. The other type of uh, way in which surgeons can help the patient with metastatic renal cancer is metastatectomy, which is essentially removal of disease of a cancer which is spread from the kidney to elsewhere in the body. So this is for a subgroup of patients who do generally very well with their cancer, and by that I mean they live for many, many years with only small spots cropping up from time to time. So for instance, I have a patient who had a lung spot cut out uh, 10 years ago and then a, a lymph node underneath the arm cut out five years ago and then a spot on a scalp cut out last year, and that's, we simply keep watching for spots and cutting them out as they come, and the patient's done well. So, uh, there is a role for repeated uh, cutting out of spread of cancer in patients who have a fairly slowly uh, growing cancer. What about radiation therapy? So radiation therapy is basically aiming powerful x-rays at the cancer. So the most common settings in which we use it are, this is a, a patient of mine who was a uh, gentleman in his late 50s who unfortunately had spread of the cancer to the bones uh, from the kidney, so that can be troublesome. And unfortunately, he broke both arms uh, in, in, uh, inside of a period of a year. But he did receive x-ray treatment to the arm, which can help strengthen the surrounding bone and also can help lessen pain. The other scenario in which we commonly use radiation is if the cancer has spread to the brain, as was the case with a patient of mine here. Um, and you can often temporarily slow down uh, the growth of cancer within the brain, relieve headaches, and improve uh, the function of uh, moving arms and legs by radiating. So some patients uh, come to the cancer center and they, they say to me, well, I expect that when you put me on treatment for my kidney cancer, I'm going to lose my hair and I'm going to spend a lot of time with IVs in my arm. And that is not the case for almost all patients with kidney cancer. So the usual type of chemotherapies that we use, say, for breast cancer, for lung cancer, uh, generally do not have uh, much of a role in the treatment of, uh, of kidney cancer. The one exception is a rare subtype called collecting duct. But for the most part, uh, the success here with kidney cancer has been with the newer pills. So I think the, a lot of credit is owed to, to this man in the advent of new therapies in renal cancer. Uh, this man is Judah Folkman, uh, who about 30 years ago put forward the therapy that cancer needs blood to grow. So his theory was that if you cut up the blood supply to a kidney cancer, uh, or any cancer as a matter of fact, uh, then the cancer will fail to grow because the blood brings the cancer oxygen and food and it needs a blood supply to grow. So now, 30, 40 years later, after Judah Folkman uh, 
put forward his theory, we actually have fashioned drugs that interfere with the blood supply. Now, we should let you know that kidney cancers are very bloody, so uh, when uh, Ms. Pugh got up here and talked about how her kidney cancer had to be embolized, it's fairly common because we know that if we don't cut off the blood supply to the tumor, when the surgeon tries to take it out, it will be an extremely bloody procedure. So it makes sense to me then that these drugs that get in the way of the blood supply to the tumor would have most of their success in kidney cancer. So these type of drugs have been tried in other cancers, for instance, bowel cancer and lung cancer, and they can make some but modest difference in other types of cancers, uh, but they've really hit their stride in kidney cancer. And I think that's because kidney cancer is so heavily dependent on its blood supply. So some of you might be out there thinking, enough about uh, Judah Folkman, <laughs> enough already. Just tell me what drugs I should be on. So uh, what drugs should the new patient, newly diagnosed patient with, uh, with kidney cancer that's spread outside of the kidney be on? This is the American answer. So the Americans have uh, guidelines that are in, on the internet to help guide physicians and, internet, or physicians and patients in their treatment choices. Clinical trial, which is basically looking at new therapies, is always high on the list. But very high on the list also is sunitinib or sutent. So what this means, the NCCN guidelines are a group of cancer experts, commonly recognized to have expertise in their field, got together and made up this list in order of preference, loosely, uh, for patients with, uh, with kidney cancer who've had no prior treatment. This is the Ontario answer. Uh, so again, uh, I'll, some Ontario experts got together and again place the sunitinib or sutent fairly high on the list. Uh, one thing that you saw on the American list that is not on the Canadian list is bevacizumab and interferon. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and we talk, and uh, the Ontario experts also recommend that if you have what's called poor risk disease, and I'll talk about that in a minute, then temsorolimus, which is an injectable drug, may be a better choice for you than sutent. So what is this good, intermediate, and poor risk business? All this means is that physicians can look at uh, uh, certain bits of information about each patient and classify them into a group uh, of how they expect to do with their kidney cancer. So those include things like what is this blood test called the LDH? What is the hemoglobin? What is the blood calcium level? Do they have multiple areas? to which the cancer has spread. And they put together all these factors and they deem a patient to either have a favorable risk, intermediate, or poor risk. And that helps us select the best drug for you. So again, favorable and intermediate risks. Uh, those patients uh, would be more geared towards the pale sunitinib and poor risk patients uh, may uh, more benefit from the injection drug temsorolimus or uh, Toracel is the other name. So, uh, so for both the American and the Ontario list, sunitinib or sutent comes out fairly high on the list of options for your first treatment. What is this? It's a pill that's given daily for four weeks of a six weeks period generally, although that may vary. Why might you not be on sutent? So it's not a good drug for people who have uncontrolled high blood pressure or people who have uncontrolled heart disease, recent strokes, recent serious bleeding because of the, the way that this drug acts on blood vessels, or other serious medical issues, for instance, recent strokes or uh, uncontrolled diabetes. What are the common side effects of, uh, of sutent or sunitinib? high blood pressure, and actually just within the past year, a U.S. Research, uh, researcher has confirmed that if you get high blood pressure on this drug, it can be a good sign, uh, uh, a sign that the drug is working, and a predictor of success in terms of shrinking the tumor. Um, most patients uh, may experience some sores in their mouth and some change in the, the sensation of taste. Diarrhea is fairly common. They often get dry and calloused hands and feet, maybe, maybe see some minor changes in blood tests, for instance the liver related tests, and rare but serious side effects include heart failure, uh, low thyroid which we usually watch for, and serious bleeding. Um, we touched on how the American list includes bevacizumab and interferon, uh, and the Canadian list doesn't. And my, a lot of my patients ask me, fairly enough, uh, you know, if I had all the money in the world and I went to the United States, would they give me any different drugs? Um, you may receive this in the U.S. and likely not in Canada. Um, 
when you look at how much these two drugs, the, the pill, sunitinib, versus the injection drugs, bevacizumab and interferon, what's the difference? Well, they're exactly the same in terms of fighting the cancer, or perhaps sunitinib may be a little bit better. Uh, it's more convenient, obviously, because it's a pill rather than bevacizumab and interferon, or bevacizumab is also known as avastin. Uh, those are both injected drugs. That obviously means time injecting yourself and time being injected in the chemotherapy room more serious side effects, and it's much more expensive than sunitinib. So this is the reason why uh, the group of uh, Ontario experts didn't put this on their list of possible drugs. Interleukin-2. Um, so this, again, is uh, injected drugs that work their, uh, their treatment through the immune system. Uh, it's generally for extremely fit patients uh, because of the risk of serious side effects to the heart and lung. Uh, why would you risk these serious side effects? Because in a limited number of patients, 8%, you may have a chance of long-term remission. So, and th these 8% of patients were largely people who had a small number of uh, spots of spread of cancer. So just uh, in my center of London, uh, about 350,000 people, uh, I might send one person a year to Buffalo, which is where I send, for inter interleukin-2 apprising them that there is an 8% chance of long-term remission, but a high risk of serious side effects. Uh, Tensorolimus, again, this is an injected drug. Uh, it's recommended for people who are poor risk, and again, that's people who have many sites of spread of cancer, people who have uh, very abnormal blood tests. Uh, this drug should be considered for them. However, it is not funded in most provinces. I believe it's only funded in BC. Oh. Four now, <laughs> BC, Alberta, or sorry, BC, uh, Nova Scotia, Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan. And Newfoundland. And Newfoundland. Ah, okay, it's getting better. <laughs> uh, one other problem, though, is that generally, if a person has growth of their cancer on sutent, uh, a ne reasonable next choice would be uh, everolimus or Afinitor. If you've had tensorolimus as your first drug, it's hard to know what will be a good option uh, after that has stopped working. Um, um, a brief minute to talk about people who have the more unusual type of kidney cancers, uh, such as papillary and chromophobe. We really don't know the best therapy for those patients. It is reasonable to try drugs like sunitinib or sutent, serafinib or nexavar, temsorolimus or toracel. Um, but they basically, because it's a less common cancer, there's a little bit less proof of how helpful these drugs are. So often my patients will say to me, well, you've put me on this cancer-fighting drug. How will you know if it's working? And the simple answer is, firstly, how are you feeling? And also taking intermittent pictures of the tumor, usually about every three months or so. So for instance, this is a patient of mine who has put on uh, sunitinib. You can see where the arrow is pointing here. That there's a fairly large swollen lymph node in the center of the chest. And after a few months on sunitinib, it's shrunk substantially. And he's maintained that since 2006. So what happens if your cancer does grow, according to these sequential CAT scans, after sunitinib, which is a drug that most patients will have taken uh, in the first line as their first drug? So what do we do after the sunitinib stops working? This is the American answer. Again, a group of cancer experts uh, made a list in roughly an order of preference of drugs that may be helpful in this situation. So again, clinical trial is very high on the list. Everolimus, which is the same as Affinitor, was quite high on the list. And the rest is uh, basically a laundry list of drugs known to have some effect in, in kidney cancer. Um, and this was the Ontario answer, that patients who have had growth of their cancer on sunitinib or serafinib or both uh, may be helped by this pill, Afinitor or Everolimus. So both the American and Canadian answers put Everolimus fairly high on the list of second-line treatment options. Uh, what is Everolimus or Afinitor? It's a pill that's commonly taken once daily at a dose of 10 milligrams. Uh, common side effects are sores in the mouth, occasional skin rash, some diarrhea, high cholesterol, which doesn't, the patient doesn't usually feel much from, uh, and rare but more serious side effects include inflammation of the lungs, which may cause cough and shortness of breath, and high blood sugar, which should be followed by uh, repeated blood tests. 
What are other options if your cancer worsens after Sutent? Uh, there may be clinical trials available and that will vary from region to region. Uh, you may try another inhibitor of the blood supply. So for instance, if you had uh, sunitinib, you may try another in that class of drugs such as Nexavar or Serafinib. Now there's going to be funding problems there unless you have private insurance. Uh, very rarely I may go back to the old standard of interferon. Um, supportive care, a brief word about supportive care, which again is basically helping the patient with uh, symptoms both of their cancer and of their uh, side effects of treatment. So drugs that I commonly use, so again high blood pressure is a common problem with drugs like sunitinib and Nexavar. Uh, so many of my patients will be on high blood pressure treatment and as I said before, uh, earlier this year an American researcher confirmed that having high blood pressure on Sutent uh, indicates a good chance that the Sutent is working to fight the cancer. Um, and he also found, well, when I read that I thought, oh no, maybe I shouldn't be treating the high blood pressure. <laughs> but uh, he did confirm that treating the high blood pressure does not, uh, does not uh, compromise the, the results, the good results that you may see if you initially did develop high blood pressure. Um, I often use diabetic type drugs for patients who develop high blood sugar, for instance on uh, Temsorolimus or Toracel and Afinitor. Uh, sometimes I use steroids if the patient develops the inflammation of the lungs, so steroid pills like prednisone or dexamethasone, skin creams for the rash and mouth rinses for the oral sores. Obviously if the patient has pain we will use analgesics. Often um, when kidney cancer spreads to bone it can commonly unfortunately lead to pain and uh, fractures in bones. So um, I think those patients should be considered for bone strengtheners which are usually given through an intravenous route and anti-nauseants and basically relief of what other symptoms they may have. What are some of the current controversies in metastatic renal cancer? Well, we talked about how patients will benefit commonly if they have their kidney, uh, or at least the tumor in the kidney, removed. Well, then the question comes up, if I see a patient who is newly diagnosed, who still has their kidney cancer in, and they have multiple spots in liver and lung, if I'm going to take the kidney out, when should I take it out? Because if I take it out at first, that patient is going to have to wait one or two weeks to get to the operating room and then two to four weeks minimum before it's safe to begin therapy and all that while the, the cancer in the lungs and liver may be growing. So because it's not safe to give the pills like Sutent very close to the time of surgery because of the risk of bleeding. So we still have to define for many patients, should we do the surgery first, should we give the pill first, if we give the pill first, how long do we have to wait until we take a break for surgery. So those questions remain to be answered. Another thing that a lot of patients ask me is, well if you know Sutent works and you know Affinitor works, why don't you give them together? It's yet to be established how safe that approach is, so clinical trials are ongoing to answer that question. Um, the other question that often comes up is I usually will give my patients a break from their drugs like Sutent and Affinitor to give radiation, particularly if it's in a spot centrally in the body like the brain or the lungs. Um, and we don't really know yet how well these drugs combine with radiation and how safe that is. And the other uh, big question out there is for the people who have the less common types of kidney cancer like uh, papillary and chromophobe collecting duct, we don't have as strong an evidence as to how these drugs will work as we do for the most common type which is clear cell. So what are my take home points today? Um, I want to emphasize again that the, the, the field of available treatment options in kidney cancer has exploded uh, just in the short time that, that I've been seeing kidney cancer patients. The side effects of most of the, the new pills that we're using are quite manageable. Patients can live uh, very often uh, with minimal side effects. Clinical trials are ongoing to still answer some important questions and many treatments are yet to come. Um, obviously, un, I don't expect you to recognize or remember any of these. This is just to illustrate the, the, the hope that's coming, the number of uh, drugs that are still in development and may become available over the next few years. So what's my goal when I see these patients? If I get back to Mr. C and uh, my golfer, I want to keep them well for the next golf season and the one after that. Um, and uh, when I look back to my, my list of drugs that are coming, my hope is high.
My question is, why is Afinitor only a second-line treatment? Should it not be a primary treatment? Um, so generally, the areas where treatment is used are usually based on the clinical trial proof that, uh, that came before. So the reason that Afinitor is approved as a second-line treatment is because it was a very large study with hundreds of patients, and all of those patients had previously received drugs like sunitinib, which is sutent, or serafinib, which is Nexavar. And uh, then the patients were either given uh, Afinitor or a placebo, and the, the upshot of the study was that the, the people who got Afinitor did better. So the answer is it's second line because the study was second line that led to its approval. Should it not be primary treatment? Well, there actually is a study ongoing right now that where patients would receive either sunitinib first or Afinitor first, and then if they had growth of their cancer, they'd be switched on to the one that they didn't have in the first place. Uh, one question that I always ask myself when I'm um, asking, or when I'm trying to answer the patient's question is, what would I want if I were in the patient's chair? And if I were in the patient's chair, I would want Sutent first, um, and that is because there's about a 40% chance that your tumor will at least, will shrink at least, and in addition to that, there's a significant chance that it'll stabilize. Uh, but on Affinitor, it's more like a five, maybe 10% chance of shrinkage. And now, that's not really a fair comparison because the people who got Affinitor had more more progressed disease. But I guess if you looked at what's most likely up front to give you tumor shrinkage, the answer is sutent. The next question was interleukin-2. Please describe ex extremely fit. Um, so interleukin-2, again, it's a therapy that um, in Canada, I believe, is only available in Quebec. So I usually send my interleukin-2 patients to uh, Buffalo. Um, it should be given in a very highly specialized center that commonly gives it because it's the, the side effects are, can be quite uh, severe, including heart attacks, heart failure, uh, fluid in the lungs. So when I say extremely fit, usually the physician to whom I refer, to, who gives the IL-2, would commonly want things like breathing tests where the patient will breathe into a tube to prove that their lungs are fit or a stress test like a treadmill test to prove that the heart is fit um, and the patient can't have any serious other problems because the stress uh, of the, the treatment, you're, you have to be in an ICU to get it, it's very risky. The people I usually send for interleukin-2 in addition to being very fit usually have um, a, a pretty small burden of cancer, so small spots generally on the lungs. And the reason that I select that kind of patient is because we know from many years of study beforehand that these are the patients who are most likely to get a very long-term remission out of interleukin-2. So the ideal patient for interleukin-2 is a pretty fit person with no serious heart or lung problems who has multiple small lung uh, spots, all less than two centimeters, but too many to cut out. Um, and again, I, I have a very long and detailed conversation with the patient about the significant risks um, and also the fact that the reason we might choose this is that there's an 8% chance of a long-term cure. By that, I mean we have patients out 15 plus years now with no sign of cancer. Next question is, um, what about zoledronic acid at the same time as sutent when there are bone mets? So zoledronic acid is an injection bone strengthener. It's of the same class of drugs as uh, are commonly prescribed for women with thinning of the bones after menopause. Um, so bone metastasis and renal cancer are um, a, a real problem. When renal cancer spreads to bone, it can often be quite destructive. I've had a 21-year-old patient who became paralyzed because it was in her spinal cord. Um, I've had the, the guy that I flashed up there with the arm break both both, both, both of his arms inside of three months. It can be very aggressive when it goes to bone. And there is proof that uh, this uh, drug, zoledronic acid, or the other name is Zometa, can lower the chances that, you're, that you will have a serious bone problem like breaking a bone or becoming paralyzed. Um, and so I, I do recommend that for most of my patients. Um, in terms of giving it at the same time as Sutent, I regularly do that. Um, I'm not aware that there's any significant medical problems. You do have to be careful that it can affect the function of the remaining kidney. And there is a very rare risk of uh, trouble with the jawbone that you have to watch for. Next question was, um, you had your kidney removed, went on a study, assume you're on Sutent in the study, 
the cancer metastasizes. Can you go on Sutent again? Um, well, I guess in terms of what's medically appropriate, if your cancer came back very close to the time that you were on Sutent, Sutent probably wouldn't work. It would mean that your cancer is resistant to Sutent. So if, the, if this were my patient and the cancer come back, say, within three to six months of having stopped the Sutent, I probably wouldn't give Sutent again because that would be evidence that it failed, the fact that they had a metastasis. Um, so I guess the, the question, the answer would be it depends on how long it took for the cancer to come back after you stopped the Sutent.